here we go um enjoy okay. the next i don't know 40 minutes or so i'll be back for for the q a yeah thank you yeah technology yeah uh, i had to press here two buttons uh one locally yeah also a warm welcome from my side i see you know really over a thousand people online um interested in this topic and uh, in general uh, from you know dozens hundreds of countries uh, so which is fantastic uh, i wish you all a happy new year i hope you have a, had a good start already um and and prepared for you know going going all steam ahead um this year um yeah happy happy to present um, not the first time this topic uh, is often a little bit, especially when we talk about uh, safety regulations and compliance, a thing that you need to, let's say, get into your brains repeatedly. Um, not only a thing with external companies, also in our company, which is also here, let's say, our bread and butter uh, business. But anyway, um, it's, it's good to have you here. If you have questions, put this in the Q&A section. We will have enough time after my presentation really to go through it. Um, and even that, you can ping me an email later uh, as well or connect via LinkedIn. Uh, more than happy, um, let's say, to, yeah, to, to get um, collaborate with you, let's say, on a deeper level as well. Uh, a short intro uh, from my side uh, for uh, who is Draeger. Uh, so we are roughly a little bit over 16,000 employees. Um, a little bit over 3 billion uh, revenue, family driven in the fifth generation. And now Stefan Dreger is our CEO. Uh, we have direct sales and service locations in over 50 countries. And, and as you can see here on the slide, also a couple of production sites, not only for, let's say, for safety, uh, because we have two big branches one is safety, one is medical. Um, and this counts for both here. So headquarters is in lovely town Lübeck, uh, which you can see here as, a, let's say, one of the blue buttons in northern Germany, close to the Baltic Sea, with a lot of history. But we have, as well, as you can see, a lot of production sites around the world, logistics center and direct uh, sales and service organizations really to work with you guys on site uh, with, with your customers, maybe, as well, together. Um, Next slide is where we are active as Draeger since, let's say, a couple of years, especially when we talk about new energies and the, let's say, the, the energy transition. A uh, big focus for sure is on, let's say, in the middle, what you can see here when we talk about electrolyzers, the production, but this whole eco chain keeps us busy and keeps you busy as well. We, uh, I personally follow here over 1,300 projects globally from upstream to mid to downstream. So that means really from the production uh, to the distribution and then to the end users, to the off takers of hydrogen, including the big ones. Um, so we pulled in into, uh, let's say, uh, green steel projects already, but fertilizers, cement uh, has also, uh, let's say, big challenges ahead. Um, and then when it comes to the left side, where we see here the mobility part, where we see yeah, tremendous uh, pro projects and investments around the world, not only here in Germany, uh, but, you know, we can go to uh, China and US, especially in California. There's a big, uh, big push um, in, in Japan already. They're doing this since years, uh, building up uh, the whole eco chain. And this is, you know, the topic today, especially the, um, the, the uh, compliance um, in a not fully regulated field is a thing uh, that needs to be reflected um, uh, from time to time. The duty is, and this, this is not only our duty, this is your duty as well, is that you have to get familiar with local safety standards and regulations. Why is this so important? I come a little bit later to that. This has many aspects, not only the safety itself, uh, it's a little bit more than this. And especially when we talk about international projects, um, and we may have here some um, OEMs um, in this audience as well, all codes and standards needs to be considered. Why? That could be that you have maybe um, did already a safety concept, 
but you have to show and have to prove and, and have to look into this if this is in the target country uh, as well uh, reflected and accepted by the regulatory bodies. And regulations, and this will be a big part of this presentation as well, will differ. Uh, in differ in terms of there are should requirements which you may can do but you don't have to and there are shall requirements uh, that you definitely have to do and there's especially a big difference between IEC uh, and NFPA uh, standards yeah looking deeper into that some statistics as well that will help um, um, since um, the 70s um, over 200 hydrogen-related production uh, accidents were recorded uh, by the uh, EIGA and analyzed as well. Uh, another uh, big uh, organization in the US, uh, Center of Hydrogen Safety, is doing the same. So we are a member of it as well. So um, almost all incidents that happens worldwide uh, are discussed in teams. Uh, these teams uh, made recommendation, recommendations as well for uh, new codes and standards. <clears throat> and if we look into that, um, these um, incidents are publicly available. Um, so, the, you know, you can just Google it and you will find all these uh, incidents with a uh, little bit deep dives into that. Um, and uh, yeah, more than happy that later, if we can uh, look into details, more than happy to share this as well. But you will find this anyway uh, when you purchase these these parts here anyway in the presentation. So what you see here that uh, incidents happens, um, the consequences are different. That could be uh, really fatal incidents to, uh, due to smaller ones as well. Smaller ones, if not really considered properly, uh, can cause larger ones um, when you don't, let's say, adapt your safety concepts. So that means really looking into that, what happened in the past will give you also a level of confidence uh, not to do the same mistake twice. Main reasons, and this is analyzed here, what you can see the source center of hydrogen safety uh, the main reasons for these incidents uh, that uh, were analyzed um, are what you can see here, leaking connections, valve malfunctions, uh, and leaks. There's a, also a lot more, but these are the majority. So that you can see, okay, this is the reason where we have to look in. But uh, looking even deeper into that, um, so that means from where it comes uh, in, in this whole process that you can see here, A and even B, operational and procedural um, um, parts of it are human factors. So that you see, I think it's really a thing where you, with your technicians, uh, with your concept engineers, uh, can do a lot more to bring in, let's say, a proper safety. And compliance, safety compliance will help you uh, to mitigate uh, most risk. And this is important um, because in this, you know, after this slide, I will give you some, uh, some different aspects, especially from insurance companies. Global gas associations, so we have a lot like CGA, EIGA, and so on and on. Um, really looking into that and over 70 publications have been globally harmonized, which is good. Uh, I, uh, um, there are a lot of new revisions in progress, uh, which even the last two years and also this year, we expect a lot more um, based on, uh, yeah, let's say, the experiences, also the incidents. Uh, and the harmonization uh, on that. Uh, and these are, most of them are publicly uh, available as well. As I said, I did personally uh, a lot of interesting discussions with uh, insurance companies. Why? As I said, we are pulled in into these projects, uh, having set up safety concepts, even if these are very large pro um, uh, projects, when we talk about large volumes, 
so we have to take into, for example, the Seveso directive um, when it comes over five tons of hydrogen storage or you know intermediate storage. Uh, then you definitely have to look uh, definitely have to look a little deeper into that. Also, insurance companies are doing own um, assessments or on-site assessments as well, really to check if the safety concept on the one hand is proven. On the other hand, did you do everything which is technical feasible? Because it, it comes to an incident. Um, you have to prove that you did not miss anything. Um, the one thing is you could say, okay, this is regulated, uh, but later in the presentation, I come to these should and shall requirements. And then um, insurance companies get a little bit, I would say, picky, um, especially how did you organize to absorb your risk? So that means you have to do a proper risk assessment and you have to have a mitigation plan. Um, and here are only three examples, uh, but even the largest insurance companies globally, FM Global, um, and this is publicly available document here, they called it property loss and prevention data sheet, which gives you a lot of insights, um, like a checklist, uh, what needs to be done and what needs to be reflected. And as you can see, also these guys take this very serious uh, to guide you, let's say, through this uh, jungle. Uh, to be honest, but also companies like Draeger, um, uh, this is, I would say, our bread and butter um, um, a business here, really to look over, let's say, equipment, over processes, uh, over protection layers, um, including when it comes really to larger uh, um, uh, projects and installations, uh, talk about emergency response, um, pre-fire planning and, and discussions with uh, these authorities as well. Next perspective is, which I guide you through a little bit, uh, when we talk about codes and standards, the shall and should requirements, and what are the consequences uh, if you, let's say, uh, do not follow it uh, properly. It could be that you do not know, but this will not protect you against the fines. Uh, so that means you have to be, let's say, on, on top of it. You have to train your own personnel on that. If you are an operator, you are liable as well when it comes to an incident. So that means you are always, let's say, in the position to be uh, to defend yourself that you did everything which is technically uh, feasible. Yeah, when we look to some uh, codes and standards across the whole value chain, and here's one example for US, I will show you uh, some uh, examples in the next slide from, from Europe as well. You see on the left side, when it starts you know, from the production, we see CSA standards, UL as well, and going, let's say, through this whole chain it, uh, NFPA plays a big role, um, SMME plays a big role. So this is really, let's say, a big um, <laughs> uh, task and duty on your side to be on top of it so that you exactly know what's going on, what is applicable currently for my, for my application here. And the same is here for Europe. Uh, it's even I would say a little bit more complicated, uh, especially when we look down to sensors and detectors. Uh, we have SAE as well in uh, the CENILAC um, um, uh, regulations as well. So that, you know, this is just an overview which gives you, let's say, the complexity of regulations. Uh, but at the end, you will maybe find yourself only on parts here of it so that maybe it doesn't make it uh, too complicated. So as I said, and I promised, what is the difference between a should and a shall requirement and how to read these codes and standards? A should is a recommendation. A recommendation means you can do it, but maybe you don't have to do it. And it more describes what to do, but not how to do it. It's mainly driven uh, and, and nurtured by industrial peers from experience as well. Um, and the decisions on that are based often only on cost, 
rather than on the risk that you may have on site uh, uh, in this whole scenario, which includes maybe the environment as well, maybe other applications which are nearby. So this, these things, if it comes to an explosion or maybe a fire, uh, you have to take these things in, into consideration as well. But a should requirement is not even as strong as a shy requirement. When we look to a shy requirement, um, it's normally done by national and federal code, enforced by industrial peers. So in most cases, they have been previously a should requirement um, driven, as I said, by historical events. We looked into the statistics um, and these are so-called historical events. Um, Education and training certification plays here a bigger role and which is definitely a part of these regulations as well. And consequences for non-compliance, including a dollar and euro amount, uh, are often mentioned and described um, in, these, uh, in these standards and codes as well. The conclusion is that you, as an hydrogen safety professional, have to review these codes and standards which are relevant to your application as well. Especially when it comes to fire, flame and gas systems, you have to know the difference as well. So which technology applies, uh, let's say to my, uh, to my risk and maybe to my hazard that I have on site. Um, and this, this definitely uh, is a knowledge uh, where you have to build up either your, your own or your teams or your partners as well. Um, accordingly to these standards. So what are typically consequences for non-compliance? So first of all, for industry standards, when we talk about IEC, for example, there's no formal audit process in most cases. Internally identified as tolerable risk and hazards and often seen as unsafe for the personnel and the facility. If you have an accident, then for sure you have legal exposure. Uh, and that brings you then, um, let's say, to a point where you have to adapt your safety concept in total. Maybe you have to uh, rebuild uh, really critical components. So that means, I would not say, do, please do not over-specify, but because you know we all have to make money at the end, and especially uh, in this growing business, um, the, the value, the economic value and the business case is really crucial. That so means um, knowing really what exactly needs to be done to be compliant. When we look uh, to shell requirements, which are local national standards, often requires um, um, audits and requiring annual audits as well, done by sometimes uh, insurance companies uh, as well. Violations. Uh, really can result in findings. And uh, we've seen this as well in facility shutdowns. As I, this is what I said, then you have to really rebuild, uh, you have to prove, or uh, you have to adapt uh, your, your safety concepts at the end. Conclusion here as well, it's more or less the same. Uh, you have to review and you have to understand the consequences of non-compliance and who is really auditing you and uh, what are, you know, the, the requirements uh, which you have to follow. The documents that I've presented or gave you an overview uh, will help you uh, really to be compliant and not to miss anything. When we look first into international fire codes and standards that describes what needs to be known, we have to start with the IFC 2021. So that means the international fire code, which gives you a minimum requirement for fire prevention and fire protection. Uh, it's really founded on broad based, very generic principles. Um, it's really similar a little bit um, to uh, the fire code NFPA 72 uh, from the US, it's really reflected by new applications, uh, 
added for especially for energy tr uh, transition applications uh, which i showed you in the beginning so it means the really the whole eco chain um, often adopted with exceptions uh, by individual local jurisdictions but can include consequences and you will find them really in uh, noted down this year in section 102 where really a shutdown and uh, in in dollars in euros uh, you will find uh, you will see what let's say the 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 fine in euro and dollar will be uh, if you are not uh, if you're not compliant here when we look to the iso standard the 19 um, um, 8800 from uh, 2016 it recommends the minimum design characteristics, especially requirements for gas detection systems. So that means hydrogen detection system should comply and meet the currency requirements. Um, and in consequence to that, the response to alarms determined during a risk assessment. So this needs to be done. This is mandatory here. And then the 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 alarms um, and and the alarm chain uh, should be fitted exactly to that. When we look a little bit over the let's say um, over the Atlantic, uh, we see uh, U.S. regulations which describes what needs to be known here as well. The primary codes are NFPA two and fifty five. And there are a reference between uh, both of them. And they have a clear code. And as you can see, NFPA were updated uh, last year uh, already. And also the NFPA 2 is from 2020 and the 853 is from 2020 as well. So which are, you know, quite really on, on, on top of uh, the current application. These codes all applies to production storage transfer of hydrogen in all occupancies and in all premises include uh, outdoor public fueling as well. So it's a lot of text, but as you can see, I highlighted a couple of words here so that this, especially here, these codes focuses on what really needs to be done. So this is not a wish list and it's not a should requirement. NFPA is very, very stringent here and really looks uh, that gas detection equipment, for example, shall be listed and approved, uh, shall be designed, installed, tested, inspected, calibrated, and so on, uh, in accordance with the manufacturing requirements and equipment uh, listed requirements. Conducted by, you know, shall be conducted by trained personnel, um, and at least testing shall be done uh, annually, for example. Uh, these are some, some examples, uh, especially taken out uh, out, of, out of NFPA too. So you could say, okay, is this really applicable and mandatory when we talk about other international projects? It can be. Um, a lot of countries really apply um, also to an NFPA standards. Why? The difference between the should and shall requirements is obvious. Uh, and um, when uh, we talk about international projects, OEMs, um, you to have a proper concept in place uh, will, as I give you, less headaches uh, when you want to ship internationally as well. Uh, and when you want maybe to copy, um, let's say, a hydrogen production facility, a re refueling station or whatever, let's say to international markets as well. So this is what we see as well in, in our discussions with OEMs as well, that let's say the knowledge of NFPA standards uh, uh, is, is, definitely, is definitely a thing that needs to be considered. Yeah, no, it's, it's going here a little bit deeper. Uh, you get uh, the informations when, when you get all the presentations here, when we talk about uh, hydrogen uh, equipment, um, enclosures, the detection, the activation of an emergency shutdown, shutdown system, the fire detection uh, is, is reflected here. And these are all, as I said, all shell requirements. So it's not, not a thing that you may can discuss away. The same counts for NFPA 55, which focuses mainly on compressed gases and cyrogenic uh, fluids code. So also for liquid hydrogen. And here the same, uh, this uh, provides fundamental safeguards for 
for the whole, let's say, eco chain installation, storage, use, and so on, uh, and containers as well. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, looking here into uh, fueling facilities, um, uh, same thing, a lot of shell requirements, including automatic stop dispensing, activation of emergency shutdown valves, um, and uh, in, uh, dedicated sections in, in 10.5, which reflects gas and flame detections and emergency shutdown, uh, shutdowns, uh, devices and systems as well. Having said this, last but not least, when we talk here about stationary fuel cell power systems, uh, same thing, this is the A53. Here as well, um, automatic uh, fire detection alarm systems in accordance with NFPA 72 is mentioned. And when it comes to fire suppression system, uh, this shall be then interconnected uh, to shut off, for example, the fuel supply. Uh, and uh, combustion uh, gas detectors shall be installed in the fuel cell power system enclosure. So this is also a shell requirement um, that gives uh, you, let's say, the, the, the proper uh, safety environment here and early leak detection, uh, which is mandatory, especially uh, when it comes here, and this is a note, um, shall not apply to 50 kilowatt systems or smaller. So there are some except, exceptions in, uh, this is mainly focused on, on larger uh, systems here as well. Yeah, I will not go through everything uh, in detail because here you see already where you, let's say, have to pimp your knowledge um, in reflection to these standards, especially when it comes to safety, uh, safety infrastructure. Uh, my outtake here is always, please do not over-specify, but especially do not under-specify these things. It needs to have a proper business case. Um, and uh, yeah, looking to the last point here where leak detection is provided, um, uh, that shall not require uh, to have a conventional gas detection to be installed. Um, so that means there's, you know, also some things in between which needs to be read carefully, um, especially when we talk about fuel cell power systems uh, and gaseous fuels, uh, which are not generating maybe flammable gas mixtures. So also here you can see it's very detailed. You have to look, okay, what is my application here? What kind of substances are involved? Is it hydrogen only or maybe other gases as well? Also the mixture here. Uh, makes it, I would not say even more complicated, but you have to be sensitive uh, to look really here into the details. So what is the route to compliance? That means the first part was, okay, what needs to be known? But then the second question is, okay, I sit here with my project. Uh, I have maybe a thing ahead of me. So how to do it now? Are there guidelines for me which I can follow that I know exactly how to set this up and there's help for example um, technical reports the uh, i say uh, technical report that was initially developed uh, to analyze chemical uh, hazards in energy chemical and other industrial facilities but which gives you a very good guideline especially on design and placement of detectors the designs in the system are from a performance-based perspective. Um, and the method is really estimating risk reduction factors. I've mentioned this already. Um, uh, a proper risk analysis needs to be done anyway. But this uh, technical report gives you a good guidance uh, how to, as I said, how to estimate the risk reduction factors, which is then reflected in, let's say, the safety concept. Uh, and the, the risk mitigation, um, risk mitigation uh, documentation that you have. And it provides guidance on how to lay out and define quantities, business case, and placement of flame and gas detectors. You know, these detectors cost money and you don't, do not want to over-specify, uh, but this gives you, let's say, a good uh, insight 
uh, you know, what, what needs to be done. I come in a minute to that. What else can be done? It's not only this document. There are also some other things uh, that, that may give you uh, some, some more even deeper insights uh, into your application. Um, the good part is uh, that the ICA report will, so this is what I expect, and I'm, I'm looking uh, constantly into it, a new publication this year, <clears throat> which adds then new clean, dedicated clean energy transition applications. Because this today is, as I said, based on a, on, a, on, a, on a broader level, more general level, uh, but here, uh, because there's a big need, especially for clean energy transition applications, which will help you then to plan properly fire and gas hazards assessments, I, the identification uh, to analyze the consequences uh, and, and uh, the hazard frequency as well, and then uh, give you let's say, a good guideline uh, for your mitig uh, hazard mitigation plan. What else can be done um, parallel to, let's say, the technical report, which I uh, presented in the last slide, you can do uh, a fire and gas mapping. Not Maybe not you personally, but there are companies out there uh, who uh, make these services um, uh, so we as Rega doing this as well with our customers together. How this is done? Uh, this is a verification of your design. So we really look into, let's say, the design on, on CAD drawings or maybe on site. Uh, and based on that, uh, there will be a definition based on the, the ISA A technical report as well and your customer guidelines as well. So what detectors do you really need which respond to the hazard that could be hydrogen or maybe could be something else as well. Uh, so one thing is the gas, maybe flame as well, or maybe you have other gas, gases around. And the big question is where should the detector be positioned? Well, this is quite important um, because the gas needs to come to the detector. It's like your nose. And may you need uh, other technologies as well. If there could be a leak, but you do not know where to place the sensors, or maybe you have, if it's an, in, uh, an indoor application, uh, heating, um, uh, climate systems, ventilators, which you know, uh, stimulate disturbances, that hydrogen maybe will never reach the sensor. So this can be simulated as well. So that means based on, on, on these drawings, you identify where should the detectors be positioned. And then you're doing a modeling. That means how many detectors are really needed, do not over, over specify it. And how can I be sure that the, the area is really protected on an acceptable level? What means acceptable, it has to do with, let's say the, the tolerable explosible atmosphere. Uh, so and and um, is the detector network that you know I'm proposing here? So it means how many detector, where to place it? Is the coverage appropriate uh, in my environment? How it's just an example here. How does that look like at the end? The modeling that you get a lot of green areas where it's okay. The coverage of my sensors in this environment here with these tanks, for example is on an acceptable level. Why is this so important? It gives you a good indicator that you did everything which is technical feasible. Why is this so important? I've mentioned that especially insurance companies and regulatory body, body if it comes to an incidence, really want to see that. Did you do this just on, on gut feeling or maybe on some experience for some guys who said, okay, I think here and there it maybe makes sense to place a sensor. This gives you a little bit more insight uh, uh, in, in simulations, reflects environments as well as I said, wind directions and so on and so on, uh, and environmental, um, environmental influences um, in, your, in your total setup. 
So this is here for gas detection. Same can be done and will be done then for flame detection as well, so that you have a coverage as well. So where I normally would possibly um, expect based on, let's say, the risk assessment, uh, a flame. And based on that, you can, uh, you can place theoretically your flame detectors and see uh, how the coverage is. On top of that, there are technologies uh, like ultrasonic uh, gas detectors where you can do a, a similar mapping study already. Um, these sensors listening uh, to uh, high pressure leaks. I would say a very, let's say, good way from 10 bars upwards, theoretically and technically even lower, but uh, to be on the safe side, I would say from 10 bars upwards. Normally, technically it starts with two bars, but it has to do with, let's say, um, the um, how far um, and, and the distance where you, you expect your leak as well. So what are the observations here? Especially in large green hydrogen capex projects, only, I would say, 0.2% of the spending is really safety related, which is not a lot. As you can see, yeah, business case needs to be positive, uh, but this uh, gives you, let's say, an indicator that the safety spending is, let's say, not, let's say, the relevant topic here, but can influence, um, let's say, your whole setup and can even block you from uh, going live. Uh, I talked about liability, operator liability as well. So that means, you know, doing a good job here and really knowing your regulations and standards and doing how to set this up uh, will give you a better night's sleep, I would say. The second thing is that the risk of shutdowns based on leakage incidents can definitely be reduced uh, with a compliance safety concept. This is proven. Uh, we're doing this since decades. Uh, and this is uh, uh, definitely uh, worth really to train yourself, um, uh, really to get uh, get the right uh, knowledge here uh, when setting up uh, these new applications. And the compliance safety infrastructure is mandatory for insurance, for banks, for regulatory bodies, uh, maybe for your partners as well going international. So that it means you have to know the laws, the rules, and the regulations, and especially the consequences as well, uh, if you do not follow uh, the regulations. Having said this, thank you. Uh, I will not bother you with even more slides. I'm more than happy that you connect with me, either personally via uh, LinkedIn as well, or you can write me an email, which is quite easy to remember. It's just my name, oliver.bornard at Rigard.com. Um, more than happy to connect with you, uh, also via Mission Hydrogen platform. Um, uh, and I'm more than happy, uh, hopefully, to ask uh, to to answer here your questions uh, that will be moderated, hopefully, by my my companions here, uh, uh, companion David. Yes, uh, thank you, um, thank you, Oliver. Um, Let's check the team, I think, is trying to, to change uh, the slides. Um, again, okay, that was um, an excellent uh, an excellent presentation. Let, let me say, as expected, so I was not surprised uh, to, to, to hear that fantastic and very interesting presentation. So let's give Oliver a virtual round of applause. Um, um, you can, I, I don't know. Yeah, there are, you can either write something in the chat um, or you can use the emojis. Um, and if you think uh, the webinar was rocket-like, um, you can use that or what else do we have? A dart, uh, let me, I think it was, uh, you know, you hit it on, on, uh, on the nail and uh, just look at the chat, um, how many people um, enjoyed uh, the webinar. Okay, so, um, before we go into the questions, let me say thank you again. Uh, as a, or let me 
express a very ge general thank you to all the sponsors um, and today especially to to Dragger for making this happen and for sharing all that um, great knowledge um, that is definitely available in the world uh, with so many people who are new to the industry to the hydrogen industry um, but uh, let me say I had a look at the part list of participants so we had um, uh, lots of uh, very experienced and very, very, let me say, famous uh, people in, in the room uh, from, um, from uh, yeah, world-class companies. Um, um, I just see uh, Roman Hackensolner from uh, Parker here um, in the room, for example, um, another hydrogen expert uh, with, uh, let's say, another um, background and another uh, portfolio. Um, but um, I don't know, let me say decades of experience. Um, all right, um, so, um, uh, okay, that was the good news. So the bad news is, um, um, uh, the bad news is I don't even know where to start there because there are so many. <laughs> We will not answer them all of them, but there, we can try. There, are, there are so many. There are so many. Um, uh, there are so many uh, many questions. So, okay, one question that we had several times. Um, you um, listed uh, the U.S. main standards. Uh, which uh, ones are similar to NFPA and 55 in the in the EU? <clears throat> Yeah, as I uh, as I try to explain a bit uh, that uh, in the EU in this overview chart uh, we have uh, CSA uh, even uh, um, uh, seen like an ISO standards. So mainly you have to reflect to the uh, ISO O standards uh, that I, I try to um, mention here. The primary international fire code which is similar to NFPA 72 as well, for example, the IFC 2021 is one which is, I would say, on, on, on a similar level. Um, these are the ones that I would, uh, I would throw in here uh, and to read, uh, read carefully through. Okay. Um... But I think uh, what you said, well, I, I wouldn't say between the lines, but uh, sometimes it was more, more between the lines, sometimes were, was more explicit. Um, um, there is no worldwide standard that covers everything. So you really have to look in all the local, uh, at all the local um, Definitely, yes. regulations. Yeah. So, because there's a there's a difference between the regulations, which is you know coming from from organizations or even by law, and then you have industry standards as well, which needs to be followed, uh, and yes. these differs mostly between continents and even countries, also in the U EU. So this is n definitely not harmonized, and you may have in larger companies uh, own. Uh, codes as well, we need, which needs to be followed. So also these have to be reflected in comparison to the international standards. As you can see, it's not easy. You have to put all over them and say, okay, you know what, what do we follow them? Uh, and uh, one thing that I will talk about next week, one of the, the lessons that I have learned is how the interpretation of uh, codes and standard uh, different, differs from authority to authority. Um, so even though you're in the same legal, let's say uh, you're in the same country, uh, let's put it that way. So you have the same legal framework. Um, one, um, what one, I don't know if they're called officers or one employee of that that checks your your documents is very familiar with hydrogen, knows a lot about it, and knows how to deal with or how to read certain uh, certain uh, codes and standards, and others don't know what hydrogen is. So they might have other requirements <laughs> that could be um, more severe or even more relaxed. So we have even... I think uh, they yeah. are... Yeah. Please. The, the good part is that is you can um, come closer to this uncertainty with, let's say, a, a clear 
a route to compliance and one is you need have to do a risk assessment absolutely and this is independent of your gas as well you know uh, because if you follow these standards then you say okay i did almost everything to identify my hazards this is one thing and then the tolerable risk which is maybe independent of let's say the gas so that gives you let's say a confident environment uh, how let's say how to follow up um I mean, at the end, no matter where you are in the world, um, if you're building a hydrogen plant, whether it's a refueling station or power to gas or whatever it is, you're responsible for 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 the safety of um, exactly. of that plant. Yeah. Uh, so um, at the end, you have to do everything that you can to make it as safe as possible. That's, I think, as a general um, yeah. rule. And the devil is in the detail, because if you're an operator, you are liable. If you're an OEM provider, you just have to follow, just have to follow your manufacturer's compliance standards. So that means at the end, the operator have, have to check and cross-check as well. Do these guys follow the standards? Uh, and here, once more, uh, a proper risk assessment and knowledge about the standards here uh, will give you... and especially the TR report, which you said, which is a guideline not to forget anything, uh, gives you a lot more confidence on this place because you could say, okay, these are too many standards. If I have to read 1,500 pieces of paper, that's too much for me. And uh, yeah, it is. ChatGPT will help in the future for sure. <laughs> but at the end, <laughs> at the end, uh, guidelines and checklists uh, uh, will, will, will help you. And especially the documents, the TR report from FM Global, the loss and prevention checklist uh, will definitely guide you through this jungle. Um, yeah, I think jungle is the right word to describe uh, what's going on out there. And uh, I mean, if we look at the uh, at the different levels, let's say there are national uh, laws or EU regulations. There are acts, there are codes, there are standards, there are TIRs, there are, you know, maybe even these webinars. Um, at, at the end, you have to follow the state of the art in all countries. So um, yeah. even if you comply with codes and standards, um, if the codes and standards they are typically a little late compared to the state of the art because uh, they have to be adapted. Um, so what is what is your opinion on that? Um, because in some some cases uh, there are standards in the in the e, uh, in the US, for example, SAE standards, and there is no equivalent in Europe or in in in, in Asia, and vice versa. Um, uh, so if um, if I'm in Europe <clears throat> and I want to build a plant in Europe and there is no standard in Europe, um, do you think I have to follow uh, the, the, the US standard just because it's considered state of the art? It depends on, I would say, on your business strategy as well. If you okay. plan to take, let's say, the concept and to internationalize or maybe you have an, let's say, you expect a request from the US, I would mm. definitely consider um, to look into the NFPA standards. Um, I would not say that the the our IEC standards here in Europe are not safe. No, I will not say that. Um, but that when it comes to compliance and especially the consequences, I would say you are you. It's my my outtake here. You will be on the safe side. Uh, follow NFPA standards because. There's clearly described what will happen if you do not follow. <laughs> At the end, if you are an <laughs> operator and liable and it comes to, let's say, really severe incidents uh, and you cannot prove that you did everything which is technically feasible, may happen. I do not know if this happened somewhere in the world, but uh, me from neither. the law perspective... Yeah. yeah, I mean, at happen. the end, um, I've, and, I've, to be honest, uh, I've talked to a lot of plant managers around the world. Uh, the first outtake is, guys, when you're sitting here, please kick me out of jail. I, I've heard this more than once. So this is what they what they really aware of, and they have this really on their on the desk. Um, so that means they take it very serious, not only for the assets, especially also for the personnel. Um, and I think that's perfectly right. And um, 
and I think it's uh, it's fine. I mean, it's uh, you just have to to make sure nobody is harmed. Um, but there is no final safety. So so I think even if you stay at home twenty four seven, at some point you might uh, I don't know you might injure yourself or something might happen. Uh, so there is life is very dangerous. At some point you're going to die. <laughs> Uh, you know, <laughs> but I want. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, but we have to to make it as safe as possible, especially for for yeah. others. So let's go back to your sensors. Um, there um yeah. there, uh, is a is a question from um from uh, yeah it's a it's he's from an oil and gas company from one of the. A British oil and gas company, let's put it that way. Um, mm -hmm. And but he's not familiar with high-pressure acoustic sensors. Um, and the question is, can mm -hmm. they, they be calibrated to exclude normal plant operations, and are they effective? Uh, I, I can, yeah. We, David, we discussed it right before the webinar, and I can <laughs> say a clear yes, it, it can be done. Uh, why this can be done, you do acoustic assessments during installations, and these assessments will uh, cut out environmental noises. And this will be uploaded to the sensor firmware. So that means uh, it's like a fingerprint. There's a lot of acoustic band sensors and, and, and so on, so that uh, you only listen and we only recognized uh, in, in with a very, very high reliability uh, only to leakages. Oh, it's like a you, fingerprint. Yeah, okay. And and but you use AI because there might be might be be noises that are well that are part of the the, the operations, but they are not normal, not like everyday uh, uh, noises. Yeah. Something that happens, I don't know, once a week or, or whatever it is. Um, how yeah. do you deal with that? So from one perspective, there are already um, in, in kind of intelligence built in that, let's say, um, only a single acoustic evidence can be filtered out. Mm -hmm. Because normally when we talk about a leak, then it will not happen only a second, so normally over you know a longer time period. So this can be cut it out, and if uh, you know you maybe rebuild your application, your site, uh, or you're doing expansions, uh, from time to time you have to uh, let's say do these assessments. This is just let's say a microphone with some logic behind that, mm -hmm. um, and going around and 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 filter out maybe new let's say, uh, noise um, uh, sources. Uh, yeah, okay. And, and so you can this upload, let's say, to your sensor network uh, quite easily. Okay. Because I have uh, uh, talked to operators um, who sometimes got free showers um, in their plants mm -hmm. because of uh, the sensors detected or, or they, the, the sensors thought they had detected a leak and started the, yeah. the sprinkler um, or a fire. I think they, had, uh, they thought they had detected a fire and then started uh, extinguishing the fires. Okay. Uh, but there, there was no fire. So... Um, uh, yeah, they got free showers from uh, from the fire extinguishing system. Yeah, this, you know, uh, hopefully, should not happen. Yeah, yeah. should not no, should but, happen. Um, uh, we we have already. Yeah, we have especially in this picture what where what you showed here, where you have I think is you know you have storage maybe compressors uh, electrolyzers yes. with a lot of noise sources as well around. Yes, uh, and there definitely you you can play sensors um, and learn what are the environmental noises and cut this out. Okay, good. Good. Um, and do you offer training for individual individuals seeking to expand their safety knowledge in the hydrogen field? Yeah, from one perspective, we have an academy anyway, especially for product trainings. Um, and when it comes to uh, more dedicated trainings, either we offer webinars, sometimes for free, like here, uh, or we have to discuss this then on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, for sure. I think there are a lot of companies, uh, consulting firms around who are doing that. Um, also regulatory bodies uh, setting up new courses and, and, and certifications for hydrogen engineers. And we are thinking in the same direction, uh, but mainly based, let's say, on the technology that we have. Uh, but okay, in general, course. for sure.
Yeah. Of course. So Samuel, I think uh, I think from from your email address dot na, it sounds like Namibia, probably. Um, I, I think so. Um, so what we what we can maybe we can help you um, uh, by with the webinar library because there is. Uh, uh, a huge amount, probably the biggest amount of Irish knowledge in the world uh, in one place. Yeah. Uh, and yes, it's not uh, not a let's say one-on-one -on -one, uh, training, of course. Um, uh, but I think if you go through that, um, you will learn uh, a lot about hydrogen uh, safety from all different perspectives. I really, uh, yes, David, I really can recommend this because I, you know, really scrolling through this and learned a lot, also applicational wise, you know, not to forget anything. It absolutely. gave also our company a lot of insights into new applications uh, and to prepare ourselves either with questions so that we do not know who to contact um, and not to forget anything and to prepare for the future as well. So this is really worth it. Absolutely. Thank you for, for, for that feedback. And uh, <laughs> to be honest, I mean, I'm, I'm a little selfish as well. So, so one of my key motivations <laughs> sure. in my life is to learn as much as possible. And uh, I just prepared um, a, a, a presentation for my team here on what I think what the future will look like, um, you know, where, where things are moving and, and uh, what is going to happen in the future. Um, what the energy transition will look like in the next 25 years. Um, and I have, I've just prepared a presentation that I will give to my team here uh, on Friday. And uh, uh, the webinar library is my biggest source of knowledge. Um, yeah. And uh, if, you, if you're wondering if fuel cell vehicles are going to happen or if ammonia is the right storage uh, and the right... Uh, the right uh, solution for certain problems. Um, you can learn everything you need to know um, about that in the webinar library. And uh, yes, I know that we have, I don't know, students from uh, rural places in Africa or Bangladesh or so, and they might be like, okay, it's, uh, that's, uh, it's very, very expensive. Um, but for, for um, a global company that is going to invest, uh, I don't know, hundreds of millions, <laughs> it's, um, it's really uh, almost, um, almost free. Um, okay, so let's go back to the regulations. Uh, regarding Europe, isn't a lot of this covered by ATEX directives and associated standards? Yes, it is. Uh, yes, it is. But there's always a but. When it really comes to new applications, uh, then let's say ATEX standards will have limitations. Let me phrase it in this way. Because uh, ATEX really looking into quite close environments, um, either if it's only a high pressure storage environment, it's uh, talking about, let's say, the zones that need to be reflected. But in some cases, do not reflect the larger application and the risk which is associated to it. And, and then, you know, and this is exactly what NFP8 took out of it and said, okay, we have to look broader and we have to take into consideration consequences, consequences with from in high pressure bottle, you know, and, and, you know, then you don't have to talk only about a zone zero uh, environment, uh, then, you know, it's even larger and the distances and, and the risk which is associated to it uh, will be better reflected and then in, in an IEC on an NFPA standard. So the one thing is really, you know, the ATEX very technical, closed application, and these standards, uh, the other standards, are really reflecting more the applications as well, like in refueling stations in general. You know, this um, uh, this is a big difference here, and also okay. these standards are constantly on review uh, and uh, will be adapted. Uh, so that means you, we, uh, we all have to be ahead of it as well. Uh, and and have to get noticed, uh, but this is a big challenge already. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's a huge challenge, I think. Um, uh, I, I I met someone recently who told me that uh, electric vehicles are not allowed uh, where he lives in in his garage. So it's a big parking garage. Um, 
because uh, the owner um, is afraid of, of of fires, of battery fires. Yeah. Um, uh, but I told him, you know, uh, if someone came up with the idea to to store, I don't know, 80 liters of uh, flammable and poisonous and, and dangerous liquid in a plastic uh, tank, and drive around at 200 kilometers per hour here in Germany, at least, I, I think that person will be called completely insane. Um, but we just get used to it. And I think we just live with, um, uh, with the, well, some incidents that just happen from time to time, but with hydrogen is different. I think hydrogen will be, it will be very critical um, if we had safety issues. Um, yeah. Um, are you familiar with the vehicle uh, standards? Uh, are flame detectors needed on, on hydrogen trucks? Yeah, as far as I know, not. We've discussed a lot with, uh, let's say, these OEMs as well. It's mainly what I've learned so far intrinsically safe. Uh, so there are a lot of inbuilt and in process, also pressure sensors and so on, and, 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 and you know, um, uh, flux sensors built in. Due to my knowledge, we one exception when we uh, when we talk about heavy trucks, not for trains, which is you know, and this is an investment good. There are definitely um, uh, sensors on board, and sometimes also the, the local codes uh, are, are mandatory to put this up. So there's a there's a difference, but for trucks, I've not seen this and did not really get um, uh, requirements out of that. Yeah. Me neither, by the way. So there are point gas detectors uh, on the in vehicles, typically, uh, let's say, in the area of the tank system. And uh, one is typically where the fuel cell system is, uh, just to be on the safe side. But um, I have never seen a flame detector in on a vehicle. Yeah, because, you know, when you drive, you have a really, let's say, a kind of ch challenging environment. Um, and uh, when you talk about point gas, for example, you, you may, the gas will never reach the sensor, you know. And uh, so that, that means that that needs to be reflected also in a kind of, of, of study and so on. But, you know, up to now, I didn't really got a request as far as I know, okay. but this may change in the future as well. Well, I can tell you some, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, I've done a project um, with a, together or for, for a vehicle manufacturer on exactly this question, where to position the sensors in the vehicle. And mm -hmm. we did tests with a vehicle, with a real vehicle, um, with uh, where we simulated a leak um, with a gas bottle and um, try to determine the best location for the sensors. And I can tell you, it was extremely, extremely, extremely challenging to um, to to get a concentration because the hydrogen went away immediately. Yeah. And we did that uh, in an, on an indoor test center. And when someone opened the door like 20 meters away, the yeah. test uh, was invalid because all the hydrogen would just uh, dissipate. Uh, so we had to build walls inside that test center to make sure um, the test is not yeah. affected by someone opening the door. So I'm really, really yeah. confident that if you're driving or even if it's just if you're driving very, very slowly, you will not um, collect the hydrogen somewhere and accumulate it um, uh, if you're if you don't build really closed or enclosures where the hydrogen cannot escape. So, so uh, yeah. I'm, I'm really not afraid of, of this scenario. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. um, all right. Um, so um, yes, uh, I was, I was right. Samuel is from uh, Namibia. So you're in a, in an interesting place uh, when it comes to to renewables, because of, as far as I know, Namibia is the best place in the whole world uh, for solar, um, with the highest um, yield of kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak installed. Yeah. So it's um, and uh, they also have a lot of wind. Uh, so I think it's a uh, it's going to be an exciting country for for projects. Absolutely, in, in the next decades. Um, um, all right. So um, thank you for a great presentation. Very insightful. Do you think blockchain-based storage of sensor data will be um, 
re recommended i think that should be recommended in order to fulfill the safety uh, audit requirements what was it blockchain blockchain yes so like bitcoin yeah, like the bitcoin so yeah yeah no. or the state um, data cannot be be modified this is an interesting view on it uh so we have a dedicated group who is really looking into and from a general perspective a safety perspective not only for hydrogen applications uh, we call it smart safety applications really looking into what can be done with the data um and and uh when it comes to and this is a really interesting topic when it comes then at the end to regulatory aspects and and what what can be done with the data how to safeguard the data at the end um it's an aspect that is heavily discussed in this whole industry from different oems we talk about digital twins as well also from the safety perspective and so on and and here you know in this environment this in the future will may play a bigger role also in terms of uh, getting especially when we talk about rural installations somewhere exactly in namibia australia in in the atacama desert in chile where you have to get all data everywhere in the world so that you definitely are aware you don't have to be on site this is a big difference to let's say our standard industries a power plant or a chemical refinery a petrochemical refinery where you have dozens and well, hundreds and thousands of people on site uh, yes. for the installations that we talk here there will be no one mainly yes. uh, that means data will play a very very crucial role what kind of data is available how to maintain the data how to clear this up how to and we we discussed currently data cubes yeah to throw everything in do we find uh, certain structures in this data is the safety relevant yes or no so this is what we you know discussing in our safety uh, smart safety uh, environment and groups uh, currently and this you know blockchain is let's say one technology which uh, is maybe applicable but a very, very interesting topic. But this is maybe for a new webinar because this, you know, <laughs> we can talk hours about it. <laughs> okay, now you said it, and we'll do it. So, so challenge accepted. Yes, we'll do that, and uh, maybe we can cover um, data security um, as well in that webinar because uh, I think that's um, uh, we have covered that before with. Um, well, who was it? Phoenix Contact, I think, um, one of our sponsors, um, one of our other sponsors. I think data security is also a big, big challenge for 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 these plans. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I just saw a question from uh, someone from another uh, hydrogen or certification specialist who was actually born or or. Uh, he's from the place where I was born and raised, and uh, he tried to call me here uh, last week, and I didn't call him back. So his question might also Hello. be a friendly reminder <laughs> to um, to call him back. Ignaz, uh, sorry, I, I I've I've seen it, but I didn't find time yet. Um, uh, I apologize. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's <laughs> let's answer his question at least. What safety e rules in the EU, EU must be applied for hydrogen use in tunnels, for example, hydrogen leaks of 700 bar storage tanks? Did uh, any rules um, or are there any rules outcome from the EU study High Tunnel? I don't know if you're aware of the the High Tunnel project. Yeah, I've heard about that to be honest, but really to answer this properly i have to admit i have no yet today no clue so uh -huh. uh, then then i really have to deep dive it's a good question and this will be important in the future i'm quite sure but today i cannot answer it so then i really have to uh, alliance with these uh, with these guys in this project and and get out okay. of uh, the, the latest discussions i do not know okay maybe i should connect the two of you i think uh, that would be a very interesting um, mm -hmm. interesting discussion absolutely um and uh, high tunnel i think was a uh, was a very was i think it's over um uh, a very very interesting uh, project that looked at hydrogen safety in in tunnels um 
and we have featured um, uh, it, uh, I think, two years ago or one and a half years ago. And But if you look at certain results, you're like, okay, <laughs> I think I need, <laughs> need a new job. I don't want to be in the hydrogen industry anymore, and I don't want to work with, uh, I don't want to be in a t tunnel uh, <laughs> anymore. Uh, because, yes, if you have a, 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 a big leak in a tunnel, you have a big pro <laughs> problem, especially the old tunnels. Yeah. Uh, that have yeah, bad, we have we have experience in general in general with these kind of applications because we are since decades in the mining business let's say quite well positioned yeah. um, and Simple. we developing um, emergency escape systems also for tunnels on railways and so on so we have guys who knows that but especially the hydrogen part is let's say just a new gas a new hazard so there is knowledge but for the high tunnel project itself i do not know but yeah. we have internally okay. uh, enough knowledge to tackle that yeah yeah i i can confirm that because with my engineering team uh, i mean we do not only do hydrogen hydrogen is an important aspect but we also do other things and uh, you, I mean, you, you're probably aware of that, that uh, Drager is also a customer of my engineering company for uh, fire protection equipment and mining uh, protection equipment. Uh, so uh, you have, I can definitely confirm that you have uh, great uh, technology and great uh, solutions for, for safe, the safety of, of, uh, of mining. Uh, of, mm -hmm. of miners, uh, so of the person, yeah. the, the people, especially, and not just you're not just uh, selling canneries, you're selling, uh, <laughs> you know, technical solutions. Um, That's true. Okay, um, are you involved uh, directly involved in IEC or ISO ISO standard uh, developments, or is Dragger as a company involved in standards uh, development? uh mostly indirect i would say sometimes we are pulled in in some working groups uh, sometimes it comes via uh, recommendations out of um public research projects where we are in from time to time uh, and then giving recommendations back let's say to the standard authorities and yes we have a group a q and r group internally uh, who lies in, in some of these working groups as well. Not me personally, but in general, yes. On a broad scope, I would say it depends. It depends also on, on currently where they, are, where they are, but in general, yes. Okay, because as far as I interpret the question between the lines, uh, this was uh, an attempt to recruit you <laughs> or someone else from you uh, into specific, certain groups. Um, <laughs> But um, more than welcome, uh, just ping a message and then we can discuss for sure. Uh, let's so see if problem. Alex Dick of, of, of uh, DLR will send you a message uh, afterwards and try to yeah. try to pull you pull you in uh, some of the groups uh, that he is involved in. Um, mm -hmm. All right, um, uh, Carmelo, probably Italy uh, from Italy. Um, is the presence of flame gas detectors sufficient in order to get FPA compliance uh, in gas hydrogen compressors canopy, regardless of distances and bulkheads between components inside? Um, uh, did you understand this is a the question? Complex question. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a okay. Complex let, question. Okay, let me let me try to rephrase it. Yeah. So, if you have flame and yeah. gas detectors, um, is this sufficient yeah. to get FPA compliance? Um, in uh, if for compressors, for example, regardless of, of safety leak distances. Detection, yeah, when, yeah, when it comes to leak detection, I would say yes. Uh, it really depends on uh, looking into the applications and what kind of additional hazards I may have. Uh, it's, this is what is maybe not reflected in the question, but this needs to be considered. If it's only, let's say, a single gas, only hydrogen, then it's, I would say it's quite easy in terms of a hazard assessment and a risk assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it, when it gets more complex, material-wise, uh, you know, uh, electrical installations, ESD, and so on, you, know, it, you have, to have to look a little bit broader. But in general, I would say when it comes to a single gas, flame and gas detection, also from the NFPA uh, standard, I reflected this here in the presentation. Yes, this is 
this is not recommended, this is mandatory uh, uh, to have gas, proper gas leak detection and flame detection. Yeah. And then an emergency shutdown system, which is uh, connected uh, to that. Of course. Um, but, uh, well, Carmelo, maybe I can uh, just add one more comment. I think uh, a leak detector does not replace safety distances or vice versa. And uh, from uh, I've read many, let's say, safety reports and, and incident reports. The good thing about uh, North America or the NFPA or, or uh, whoever it is who triggers it, um, um, is that lots of these reports are published afterwards, so you can uh, you can draw your conclusions from that. And uh, one of the the general rules that I always conclude: uh, safety distances help to um, prevent um, propagation of uh, of of flames and and. Um, of 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 fires uh, or or of of, uh, of the hydrogen, um, so if you can confine the hydrogen or or make sure the flame does not affect other pieces of equipment, um, it definitely helps. And one more thing that I hear from many many people and that I um, subscribe, uh, I would subscribe to immediately um, leaks are there they will be there sooner or later you will have leaks um uh, so there is no no leak tight installation in the world um so it's just a question of probability and of size um and so you have to make sure well you 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 deal with these uh, situations and the sooner you detect yeah. it the better it is and the sooner you shut off uh, uh, the source of hydrogen the better it is um and uh, the more safety distances you add the better the better it is yeah this is this is i would say also a kind of a regulated when you're doing a risk assessment normally you're going over can i let's say um take the hazard away okay if you want to deal with hydrogen, you cannot. If I can substitute, it uh, will be also difficult. And then it goes to so-called architectural uh, and, and, and process-related um, measures, where arch especially architectural safety distances, if you have roofs, uh, ex explosion, uh, proper roofs, and so on, uh, to limit, let's say, the, uh, the energy uh, from a co combustion or from a fire or from even an explosion. Ocean. And at the end, uh, the last but most important thing is then the detection part. So this is really the technical part, uh, which comes after, let's say, the recommendation when we talk about safety distances and so on uh, as well. So this is also, you know, from the, this is a design principle behind that, which okay. you normally uh, you follow. Of yeah. course. Yeah, it's. Um... Yes. Um, okay, just uh, to 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 comment on one comment. Yes, the webinar library is expensive. Just thinking about about it being an individual hydrogen enthusiast from Nigeria that is passionate about learning deeply about hydrogen. Um, I completely agree uh, agree on that. Um, if you're an individual uh, hydrogen enthusiast from Nigeria, or I mean, you can replace uh, Nigeria with uh, many many countries out there. Um, Yes, uh, I, I, I can definitely understand that. And we have been thinking about uh, solutions uh, for, let's say, for, for, for this kind of audience um, uh, that uh, lives in developing countries. And uh, yeah, we've been thinking about it. Technically, we haven't found a solution for it. And um, unfortunately, um, we, I have to pay salaries to, to <laughs> to some people over there, um, so um, I think we do we do a lot for free. But yes, we also uh, need uh, some money to to uh, well to pay the salaries and to pay the software and everything that we do. Um, so we need to find a compromise on that. Um, sorry for that, um, but I'm sure. Uh, I just look, have had a look at uh, the. Uh, uh, the latest publication of the Hydrogen Council, they are now at $530 billion uh, dollars, uh, worth of project that they are tracking. 
I think that's insane. I don't think that this is true. This number is uh, is just fantasy for from my perspective. Uh, but even if it's not 530 billion, even if it's just 50 or 100 billion or whatever it is, um, it's a huge amount of money. And compared to 100 billion, 997 euros is well, it's less than peanuts. It's uh, I don't know, peanut powder, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, okay. Um, um, hi, Dr. Oliver. Thank you for the amazing presentation. A quick question. Do you think hydrogen safety will play a significant role on green hydrogen safety, uh, green hydrogen offtake contract development? It's like almost a political question and <clears throat> uh, when um, I'm, you know, going around discussing this uh, in even two days ago, I was invited in Berlin uh, to, uh, let's say, a political round where a lot of CEOs came together, including um, uh, Mr. Teurer, yeah, Parliamentarische Staatssekretär. Um, there were similar discussions as well. Um, what what needs to be done? What needs to be considered? Uh, cost around that and and safety. To be honest, is also often forgotten. Uh, I was happy to be in this round and just to raise uh, some. I wouldn't say not concerns, but at least recommendations, uh, because the biggest threat that we currently have is. In, in the ramp up, and we talked about billions of uh, dollars in euros, uh, which you know will go up. If we will have a bigger incident, and this happens years ago in Norway with just one refueling stations, and they shut it off everything until you know they really investigated what happens there. And this is the big threat that we currently have, especially in these new applications. If we will have a blow up of a large hydrogen uh, facility. Uh, a, a, then you know we have big discussions, uh, and also the the public will question this, and this is my you know my outtake out of these discussions. Uh, have this in in our minds. You know this is the biggest threat that we have in this whole transformation. That somewhere when we talk about big energy you know amounts and volumes concentrated on on small areas. Uh, that we 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 definitely have to be ahead of it, and this is the biggest threat. I, I would add one more aspect, often operated by people who have never seen or done anything with hydrogen before. Uh, that's from my perspective, yeah. uh, even yeah. even more challenging because companies or pe people who have uh, operated ammonia facilities or chemical factories or, or yep. refineries for decades um, have uh, a very, typically have a very good training. They have a very high, uh, they have a, a safety company culture. But if you're operating, I don't know, windmills or, or, um, or hydropower plants, um, let's say, let's, let's stick with windmills or, or solar farms, you're like okay, yeah. you you just install these solar panels and they, there they are. So there is no 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 safety needed um, or almost no safety is needed. Um, and uh, I talk to lots of these people who are like, uh, where's the problem? Just install that electrolyzer and and uh, yeah. and we're fine. Uh, no, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, fully, fully agree. Fully agree. Uh, it's not comparable to standard businesses with decades of history. We have here new players in the markets, uh, new operators, uh, new facilitators, uh, and and definitely, as I said, I I really I mean it. Uh, we have to be ahead of it. This is a reason why you know I bring over this message, this, despite that we for sure sell equipment here but it's really it drives me personally because it's exactly like you david uh this is something where you know where we all together uh have to take the duty here Abs absolutely and i think uh i mean we have uh i've known you for for a couple of years now and uh i definitely believe uh that 
uh, you're not on, you don't do not only have a job or <laughs> or something you know that you do uh, to 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 pay your bills um i think you really have that personal ambition to make uh, the hydrogen world as safe as possible and uh, to to protect the lives of uh, of the people that are working with hydrogen on a daily yeah exactly yeah absolutely on a daily business so so i definitely um believe uh, <laughs> believe that because that's uh, what what i hear as well okay um ladies and gentlemen 90 minutes uh, are a very short um are very short uh, when you have uh, such a fantastic expert uh, and so many 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 good questions um i think yeah. we can't answer all of them but let's uh let's do two two or maybe three last uh last questions um is there modeling software for hydrogen safety distances and do you provide training on this topic yeah i've i've just you know highlighted uh, a bit on that yes there are and we partnering with uh, companies who are doing that for us and and for our customers as well and especially yes uh, these are the simulation softwares namely fire and gas mapping this is a name for it uh, where you definitely uh, bring in the values that you have then simulate that and that gives you then uh, let's say a proper understanding am i safe also within the distances or not yeah yes um let me say how we do it uh, we do cfd model modeling very let's say standard uh, nowadays but still challenging but um this definitely helps um we use hiram developed by i think Sandia yeah. national lab um and uh we have a third software but i just I just forgot the name. I would have to talk to my specialists over here. So yes, there is there is software um, out there. Yeah. Now a question. Okay, with a with a smiley. What is gas tight? Um, I mean, it's it's also. I mean, it starts with it starts with this uh, simple question. What is gas tight? Um, what is a leak? What is your d definition? When is a leak um, a leak? Let's say from a safety perspective, I would say uh, a leak starts when it's getting safety critical. And okay. Safety critical is then quite easy to define. You need uh, in the atmosphere below four percent. I think it's you know there are certain rules, and these are mm -hmm. defined how low the atmosphere have to be uh, to be acceptable on an acceptable level. Uh, that could be tended in some things. It could be, you know, these A1, these different levels that you normally have to follow. There you could may define what a leak is or maybe an acceptable just, you know, dilution of gas through yes. gaskets or whatever. This happens. Uh, but I would define it uh, really uh, from, let's say, the ATEX standards. Uh, so what, you know, uh, when we talk about hydrogen, we have 4% volume. And yeah, and then below that, uh, there are certain rules that me needs to be followed and needs to be detected. And this is for me clearly described in, in the standards. All right. Okay. Okay. Now, one last question. Um, I don't know uh, if uh, that will cost us another 30 minutes or if uh, you're not familiar with it. Um, uh, in the north of uh, of England, uh, there was a project or is a project um, with household heating with hydrogen. And uh, yeah. it has been criticized and there have been safety uh, studies. Yeah. And uh, as far as I know, I haven't, uh, uh, don't get me wrong. So I, I haven't, I don't, I don't have the full knowledge on that. Some of uh, these uh, safety studies had uh, disappeared appeared or were not uh, really published uh, because uh, they included or they had raised some concerns about the safety of uh, of, of the people uh, uh, heating with hydrogen um what do you think of hydrogen how uh, uh, to for, as a household heating um 
solution. This is also, a, uh, let's say, a political question. On the one, on the one hand, we are involved in this project and okay. doing assessments and also uh, installations in these households. So a lot of testing and simulation as well as part of it. Okay. From a political perspective, I would say it makes no sense because the hydrogen that we are producing currently is so much worse not to be burned in households, really to decarbonize our industry. So this is my outtake here. Uh, this is maybe one of the reasons why this pilot is only maybe in UK and nowhere else, due to my knowledge, be copied currently. You know, having this very high valued uh, renewable hydrogen shouldn't be burned in in households currently. You could say from a climate effect, that's yeah. fine. But I would say from uh, the where we need to decarbonize kind of where the bigger effect it's in the industry. Um, well, uh, let me correct you with one detail. Uh, there is one uh, pilot project in Germany as well in Ingolstadt, Audi town oh, okay. mm -hmm. uh, with, I think eight houses or something like that. Uh, so mm -hmm. relatively small and controlled, uh, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. it's going on and it has been used by um, one famous politician in Germany to uh, to to fight heat pumps you know um, and to uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. he he was claiming you know how stupid everybody else was uh, to to uh, to follow the heat, pa heat pump path uh, if you can do it with hydrogen uh, but he didn't answer the question where <laughs> the millions of tons of hydrogen come from of green yeah. hydrogen uh, will come from uh, to heat millions of homes um so that's a small and important detail and uh yeah i think we both agree on that um that there are more or better applications for hydrogen uh, but from a safety perspective do you think it could be done if we had enough hydrogen yes, yes. yeah okay good wow was that amazing or was it amazing or was it amazing? Ladies and gentlemen, please give our speaker, Oliver Bornholt, a virtual round of applause in the chat if you liked it. And even if you didn't like it and you're still here, uh, well, I wouldn't believe that you didn't like it. But uh, yeah, if there is something he can improve or we can improve or something that you missed, yeah, uh, please me. share it in the chat. Um, we are open to uh, every um, piece of feedback um, that uh, you want to give us because we want to learn. Um, if you have topics or other speakers that you're interested in, please share it with us. And um, uh, okay, I just saw one one last comment uh, for hydrogen only workshop and conferences. I'm interested in hydrogen safety for for the mining sector. Wow, that's a really re really really good idea. Um, we have never covered that uh, before. Um, maybe we can ask Oliver uh, to provide that or or to to. Um, to support us with that um, yeah. or bring in other people um, uh, from from uh, sure. from his mining um, from the mining can we for sure can be discussed so, uh, Drager. so um, look um, lots of uh, hands and and uh, and uh, thumbs up and and so on nice presentation so thank you very very much Oliver for this um, these insights. Um, I think we. It was a pleasure. I I have the impression that we helped to save some lives uh, in the future today. Oh.